Christmas, the unsanitised version. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. Christmas is coming. And if it's not done already, then it'll soon be time to get up the attic and root out absolutely everything. The tree, the decorations, the lights, the cuddly Santas, Cliff's Christmas album, and that other vital Christmas accessory, the rose-tinted spectacles. Uh, you say? What is he going on about? Well, let me explain. Soon we'll be into the whole run of special services, all the happy traditions, all those lovely customs. And I think it's sometimes good for us to take a step back before we get lost in it all and to ask ourselves what it's really about. Before we put on the rose-tinted spectacles and get lost in the, the warm glow of Christmas, maybe we need to have a clearer look at the reality. Now, you may or may not know, but for a number of years, I was heavily involved in running Crossfire. That's the youth camp organised by Gear for the Fury, uh, United Reformed Church Youth. And Crossfire in those days took place in a barn, actually in a huge cattle shed. But I don't know how many of the young people actually realised that. By the time they had arrived, the whole team had been at work to make this place ready. The cattle were moved into a field far away where then our noise could not disturb them. A tractor had been at work with a huge sludge trowel to remove all the evidence they'd ever been there. The floor had been dried like concrete. A stage had been set up, banners mounted on the walls, hay bales and benches scattered around for seating. And really, it was rather cosy and romantic. It had a great atmosphere anyway. But one year, I got a real treat. One young person needed a lift, so he had to come a day early with me. The weather had been bad, so the schedule was running late. The cows were out and the sludge plough had done its stuff, but as we walked into the empty barn, the floor was still wet. Slowly, comprehension dawned on that young person's face. I saw him lift his foot and examine it. What's that on the floor, Nick? He asked rather nervously. And when I told him, he went strangely quiet. And when I next saw him, he'd taken himself off into a corner, sat on a pile of hay bales, somehow unable to bring himself to put his feet down on the floor. Little did he know that God was in that place, and very soon God would be moving in the power of his spirit and his glory would be filling the barn. The one who was born in a cattle shed now to be born in the hearts of many young people that weekend. And I couldn't help talking to my young friend about that later, pointing out to him that he had seen for himself Christmas without the rose-tinted spectacles. Christmas, the unsanitised version. And maybe because he got dirt on his feet, he understood more than us the harsh reality of it all. Who knows? What I do know is that most of us have only ever seen the sanitised version. It seems that Gordon Fraser's photographer, when he visited the stable, liked the atmosphere of it but could not stand the smell. He came back a couple of weeks later with the team from The Life of Grime with Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen and the whole Changing Rooms gang too. And they did a good job, and we like what they did. So every year we watch the rerun, and the rose-tinted spectacles are a vital Christmas accessory. But the cute, the cuddly, the classical, and the clean Christmas card nativity, they all tell us a lie. 
They misrepresent the truth. And maybe, if we're honest, so do we. Year in, year out, the sanitised version. That's what we give, and that's what we get. Or maybe not always. I've got a video at home of a TV series shown uh, a good number of years ago now, starring Tony Robinson. That's uh, Baldrick, or the presenter of Time Team, if uh, you hadn't quite cottoned on to who he was. But his telling of the Christmas story, called Blood and Honey, Herod's Christmas, wasn't uh, his usual funny stuff. It was shocking. In places it was quite frightening. It was thoroughly disturbing throughout. This Christmas story was definitely not for the children. But then was it ever? What about the bits we often miss um, or don't let get past the senses? Like the massacre of how many babies? There was weeping and crying in Rhema as countless mothers wept for their slaughtered children. And what about the poverty, the pain, the oppression? What about the dirt on the floor? What we've done to Christmas may well be a good advert for Mr Sheen, but the reality was much harsher than that. It included the stench of urine and dung. There were most likely flies around with the cattle. Flies, not robins. And the family faced rejection, homelessness and poverty, fear and terror. The saviour we celebrate entered into our real world with all its pain, with all its dirt. And perhaps, perhaps because we've heard all these stories so many times before, that shocking element is simply glossed over. You would expect the King of Kings to come to earth in splendour, wouldn't you? Even the so-called wise men went looking for him in the palace, stirring up a right hornet's nest in the process. But he was not found in the palace, not even in the inn. Mary and Joseph had been turned away from the only lodgings available in Bethlehem. They were out on the streets, homeless and unwelcome. They had to find shelter wherever they could, and by any standards. What a dreadful place it was. But you see, God understands what it is to be homeless. God understands what it's like to have the door slammed in your face time and time again to shelter in appalling housing conditions because that is all there is available, save the street. And there is squalor, there is poverty and homelessness, there is rejection in our world. God knows that. God knows. And it seems so terribly cruel that someone about to give birth should be turned away from the inn. Did they not recognise her need? Was no one aware or willing to do something to help? Was no one willing to give up their seat, so to speak, for a pregnant woman? No one. The whole family were at the mercy of heartless people, people who had room for no one but themselves. It really is astonishing that the one who had the power of the universe at his disposal should become helpless like that. But he did. God understands what it is to be rejected, to be ignored in your crying need, to be treated heartlessly and cruelly. And there is heartlessness and cruelty, apathy and selfishness in our world. God knows. God knows. And Christ was born in dirt and poverty alongside all who were born in dirt and poverty because of the dirt of our sin and the poverty of our love. He put his foot down and stepped into the dirt to draw us out of it. There are no limits to the depths he went to for love and for our salvation. And here, if you've not heard it already, is good news for you 
and for the world. The highly sanitised versions of Christmas don't get to the truth of it, but Christ, born in a cattle shed, coming into the dirt and the smell and the poverty and the pain of our world, that certainly does. The fact is that Christ, who was born in a place with dirt on the floor, can be born into the world, into our lives and our hearts, which also have dirt on the floor. Try as we might, it's not really possible for us to present a cleaned up version of the world in which we live today. We know it stinks. But we may try and present a sanitised version of ourselves to the world, a clean image with all the dirt shoved under the carpet. But the Bible is more honest when it says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When it acknowledges that there are things inside of us that make us unclean. For from within, out of our hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and make us clean. So said Jesus in Mark chapter 7. Somerset Morgan has, uh, in a moment of uh, honesty, said, if I wrote down every thought I've ever thought and every deed I've ever done, then people would think me a monster of all depravity. That may sound rather melodramatic, but if we manage to connect our brains up to a video projector and play back everything that's there in our, in our memories, in our hearts and our minds, well, who would be the first of us to volunteer? But the truth is there are things about us that even we ourselves can't bear to see, let alone wanting anyone else to know about them. Whatever air of respectability, whatever gloss or makeover we might apply, there's dirt on our floor too. But this is exactly where the good news comes in. It is precisely because of the dirt, the pain, the poverty and the heartlessness that Christ was born. He was born into it. He desires to be born into us. There is nothing unsavoury that will keep him out. He comes nonetheless to save us. In closing, a, a final reflection that... When I was at college uh, studying to be a minister, we were discussing together in a group what it, uh, well, why did Jesus die? We studied images, the word pictures of Jesus dying on the cross, and then we were asked to come up with a, a modern word picture to describe it. And the most uh, interesting uh, and striking suggestion to come out of this was this, Christ our sewer. Christ our sewer, through whom all the dirt of the world is drained away. And maybe some of the more graphic words for dirt that we don't use in church could paint the image even more dramatically. It's not a savoury thought, but it is a powerful one. It's not a picture that fits well with rose-tinted respectability, but it is one that sums up quite perfectly just exactly what this Jesus Christ came to do. Amel Gibson's film, The Passion of Christ, caused major controversy because it set out to portray the, a realistic and unsanitised telling of the Passion depicting Christ's suffering and death on the cross in all its bloody reality. And many of us could not bring ourselves to watch that. What we may need is for Mel Gibson to make a prequel, a bloody and unsanitised version of the birth of Christ. Perhaps, actually, that's the only way to do it because it is only the unsanitized version that gives us our true hope born in the dirt of a cattle shed christ can be born in the dirt of our lives and into the dirt of our world 
and make all things new. So, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, their great glad tidings tell. So come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel.